Radu's book talks about this chamber beneath the Sphinx, where it took them a considerable amount of time to get at it and open it with, with American technology. Amer the, the Romanians had the, the territory, but the Americans had the technology. And this was all put together through Italian Freemasonry and a very suspicious character who, who could not be trusted. But nevertheless, he had his, his Masonic links into the Pentagon. And when they, they breached this chamber, they were able to get it technology, which was holographic. Although it was ancient, estimated to be 50,000 years old or so, it was more modern than ancient. And of course, it would read out, uh, if you put your hand over ta these tables, which were is, is like nine feet high, they'd have to get up on a chair. If you put out your hand over a so section of the table, it would read out holographically uh, your DNA. Uh, and you would see it, if you put it closer, it would get molecular, you know, it would get more molecular, more atomic. It might have even gone to the quantum level. I don't know. They didn't discuss that. But uh, other tables, you put your hand over and you would see a readout of an animal form and the star system that it came from. And if you put your hand simultaneously over another section of the table, it would show you another animal with another star system plus a hybridization of the two animals. So this was a virtual Noah's Ark, but it was much more modern. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here is Dr. Michael Sala. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Peter Moon to Exopolitics Today, who has had a long history of working in the exopolitics field, UFOs, extraterrestrial life. And so I'm very happy to have him on the show to tell us about his latest research. So welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you, it's very nice to be here. Well, I first was uh, introduced to your work when I was uh, it began my initial research on exopolitics in 2003 and I came across this very mysterious uh, project called Montauk. And I really couldn't make heads or tails of it because it was talking about things like time travel and um, people like Al Bilak, uh, Stuart Swerdlow, Preston Nichols. And I mean, these were all new to me. I, I was really just beginning my research into exopolitics, but you already at that time uh, was, was doing extensive research and eventually began writing or had written some books by that time. So why don't you tell us about your involvement with the Montauk Project and your research? Well, of course, the Montauk Project is the story of Preston Nichols, who was deeply involved in it as a scientist. And I met him in, in 1990 and I wrote his work. Uh, part of it, uh, the challenge was getting him to explain all of his complex experiences and complex uh, understandings of technology as it bridged from the uh, exoteric, which is the outer world, into the esoteric, which is the inner world. And of course, with much embedded into his mindset were the concept of, of aliens or extraterrestrials. And, and the Montauk Project is about experiments with time. It's experiments with time and the psyche, the human psyche, the human consciousness, and aligning it or exploiting it with radio waves. And it's all about Preston's expertise as a uh, radio uh, radio expert in, in the field of electromagnetics. So that's the Montauk Project. It gets involved in time, time travel, and then we began an investigation of the exo of the uh, the journalistic objective aspects of it, in conjunction with separate to that, I did a of the hidden aspects, which are, are the occult aspects. So there are two different branches of the investigation. The occult, of course, is more interesting because it deals with synchronicity, coincidences, and uh, odd phenomena. Whereas the journalistic investigation proved that they were doing a secret experiments there. And that they had, we changed the whole base. They had to open it up as a state park because it was state land and they were doing secret projects on it. I th think they still do, but you can now go there. Uh, and there was a whole trial over it and everything that uh, helped 
the New York State Parks Commission to uh, clean it up to the extent that they could and make it a state park so everyone can go there now. This is at the eastern end of Long Island, Montauk, New York. It was an old Air Force base, I should mention, and they were operating clandestinely there. So that that's, I mean, that's the background of uh, how I became involved in some of the, the more, uh, I guess what you'd refer to as extraterrestrial aspects um, that, that you want to talk about today. And, and maybe I should just bridge into that for you. Uh, so basically th this book was published in 1992. By 1999, I was introduced to a, uh, or a man came to our, our meetings we used to have every month, Dr. David Anderson, and he was a time travel scientist who was at that time making time slow down or speed up in a small self-contained field about the size of a soccer ball. As time moved forward, he was, he was doing work in Romania. He had uh, scientists in Romania who were helping him with his project. So he invited me to Romania in 2008. And at that same time, I had just agreed to publish a Romanian book about the Romanian Sphinx and what was found beneath the Romanian Sphinx. There is a Sphinx in Romania that is uh, in the Bucej Mountains and about the Pentagon had discovered through their ground penetrating radar satellite technology, they had found about 300 meters, a chamber that they could not penetrate. They could not figure out what was inside it. It was very mysterious. And the investigation of that chamber, how they discovered it, and all of this drama, high conspiratorial drama that ensued is what this book, that uh, the first book that I published, it's a Romanian book called The Transylvanian Sunrise, is what this book is about. So that, and my adventure to that land, I've been to Romania about 11 or 12 times, but I, I was not able to access this chamber myself. I was able to learn about it from the book that you have read, Transylvanian Sunrise. And so this is how I ended up uh, interested in Romania. And of course they had published the Montauk Project book in Romanian. And the, the person who wrote the book, Radu Sinemar, had seen uh, the book and told the story to my Romanian publisher. And this is how this came into the world, this incredible story that we're about to indulge in. So just to kind of like bridge the earlier work that you had done with uh, the Montauk, with the Buchej Mountain discovery was this figure, David Anderson, who you've described as kind of a mysterious figure that heads up some kind of Time Travel Research Institute. So can you explain you know, why you believe he's the real deal, why he, uh, the organization he has created or several organizations he's involved with, and one of those involves time travel, why you believe that is, or is credible and, and why it was that you took his recommendation uh, to treat this discovery in Transylvania very seriously? Well, uh, David had actually appeared, uh, he subscribed to my newsletter, the Montauk Pulse. He was at that time in about 1998, was on Long Island and was creating a, trying to create a time travel museum. He was collecting all this information on time travel. The only reason I met him, he just returned from Romania and he attended one of our meetings and he seemed dead set on working with me and helping me. He set up my first website uh, and he was, he, uh, when he read the book, The Montauk Project, he said it woke him up as a spiritual being. In physics, we refer to the spiritual being as an observer. It's the same thing. They just give it a different context. So David was, uh, he, he was helping me. He appeared as somebody who believed in what I was doing but he was doing the real deal as far as what he said, as far as slowing time or speeding it up. When I first met him, I could tell by the way he talked, he knew exactly what he was talking about. And uh, he told me that he wouldn't be able to meet with me. I mean, he would meet with me, but he wouldn't, he couldn't always, I couldn't always count on uh, him being in touch because he's very busy. Well, there was a lot of uh, drama that eventually was to come into his life 
uh, which I won't go into today, but basically he was taken out of the time travel business, he said, because uh, after 9-11, there was a, a lot of security issues at his time travel research center and they were breaking into it. It was being broken into and the government said, we will uh, help you with your security issues if you make us your partner, which made me think that they were causing the security problems in the first place. Nevertheless, uh, it was in 2003, I think it was 2003, uh, yes, he said, I, I, he had given me all this stuff from his, uh, his time travel research center, which was mostly books and art, some CDs, or DVDs and whatnot. But he said that he couldn't work with me for another five years. And it wasn't until I contracted with the Romanian publisher that he, he almost to the, to the week, uh, he, he contacted me and said, how would you like to go to Romania? Now, I thought that there was gonna be a big explanation of what his connection to this stuff with the Sphinx is. There is apparently no connection other than myself, apparently. But he, um, in 2009, I returned to Romania again, and he lectured extensively on time travel. In 2008, he said he was, he was going back into the time travel business. Uh, and then he put up a website. In 2009, he lectured extensively in Romania, and I attended those lectures. I also lectured with him giving a different perspective. And this was primarily to young people because the camp that I go to in Romania, Atlanticron is for young people. When I say young people age 16 to 30 and it's educational and it's affiliated with UNESCO. So he, but so he's giving these lectures and he tutors me privately on one concept about it's called the invariance of the space time interval. Uh, and trying to teach me how simple it is. The problem was I understood it when he 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 spent time with me, but then, you know, two days later I forget it, and I had to really, uh, when I got got home, crack crack the books on it and really understand it. Um, but it's a concept, and to to answer your question, why he is the real deal, because he's explaining how time is distance. Time can be computed as distance, just like when you see the, uh, an, what do they call it, a sundial. When you see the shadow on a sundial move, you're, you're, you're measuring time and distance because the shadow moves on a sundial. So this, this can be put into very simple math. It's very simple math, but it's hard to grasp because of most of the way we think. And I put this into a website called the Time Travel Education Center. And with eighth grade math, uh, and it took me a good seven years to figure this out, even though it's, it's understandable. It took me seven years to figure out what is basically eighth grade math, that time travel does not violate the laws of math or physics. So I have put this into a, a series of seven free videos. And he, at that time, uh, during his lectures, that was 2009. In 2010, he announced that he could put humans into a time. And he, in 2010, he appeared at a conference I was giving in Montauk, New York, and he showed us a video of a amaryllis plant growing in three minutes, which would normally take three or four days. So he showed that to a group of about 20 people. It wasn't widely attended. In fact, it was actually hard to get people to come. Uh, even, even certain people I would invite for free. They were friends of mine. I wanted them to see David and to see this. It was like pulling teeth. Even though the few who came, it was like pulling teeth to get them to come. It's, a, it's very strange. There's a, there's a whole psychology around this. Nevertheless, uh, I saw this. It was witnessed by different people. And over time, I began to understand the theories better. But it's still not easy to get people to understand uh, because he said when he would lecture to a group of people like at a university, it was the young people that would catch on first to the concept. So th the science is very clear and the prejudicial or egocentric views of scientists in general, including Nobel Prize winner, they're so egocentric that 
they they don't understand and they will even lie about it. For example, uh, one of them said this can't possibly work. David's time reactor. There's a patent uh, he filed on a time reactor. He says it can't work because it it needs too much power. Well, this has all been demonstrated. He has power. It's all in the patent. How the power uh, that the power you need tremendous amount of power to move time. So uh, I was convinced he was the real deal. And although I will say that he remains very mysterious and that the biggest problem with time travel, as well as the incredible technology described in these books by Radu Sinemar is access to the technology. It's like, how do you access it? Um, understanding it is one thing, but to be able to access it is a whole nother bridge of, uh, of hurdles to be able to to get at it. And then, of course, if you were able to change time, what would you want to do with that? It's it's considerable amount of power. So it, it's not something, it's like getting to uh, all the money in the bank, being able to control the, you know, Bitcoin or something like this, you would be tremendously powerful, but not anybody can walk in and do that. So uh, that's, David Anderson was the bridge because he actually brought me to Romania. And over the years, he proposed that I serve as a board member of the World Genesis Foundation, which helps sponsor the camp in Romania. And it's a, it's a foundation that he found, founded to educate young people. And of course, now I'm a board member of that, and he's sort of moved away from that. I will periodically hear from him, but not too often. Uh, there's further research of his that I've become involved in very deeply, uh, this associated with time, but that's a bit of a bridge as to how I got to Romania. He brought me to Romania, and then I've been uh, had the advantage to be able to explore there, including visiting the Sphinx and other areas of interest, as highlighted by the author Radu Sinemar. And of course, it's worth pointing out uh, for my listeners that the Montauk project was very much involved with time travel as well, that there were these uh, 20 year loops that was involved in that. And, dating yes. back to the Philadelphia experiment. And so it makes a lot of sense that this uh, mysterious figure, David Anderson, was very interested in your early books on Montauk and the time travel component in there for his own research into time travel. And of course, uh, you were able to confirm that the uh, Montauk material as presented by people like uh, yeah, Preston Nichols uh, was this uh, electrical engineer who, who had a lot to say on the way in which time travel occurred in the Montauk project. And so um, David Anderson was, was that bridge to this work now that you're doing with uh, Radu Cinema and uh, publishing his books. So in the Transylvanian Sunrise, uh, you published that book, uh, I think, what was it, around 2009, 2010, uh, um, and it's an trans English translation. So what is it about Radu that convinces you that this is real, this uh, material is based on factual events rather than fiction? Well, before I answer that question, I should first comment that, that uh, Radu's book talks about this chamber beneath the, thing, the Sphinx, where it took them a considerable amount of time to get at it and open it with with American technology. Ameri the, the Romanians had the, the territory, but the Americans had the technology. And this was all put together through Italian Freemasonry and a very suspicious character who, who could not be trusted. But nevertheless, he had his, his Masonic links into the Pentagon. And when they, they breached this chamber, they were able to get it technology, which was holographic. Although it was ancient, estimated to be 50,000 years old or so, it was more modern than ancient. And of course, it would read out, uh, if you put your hand over these tables, which were is, is like nine feet high, they'd have to get up on a chair. If you put your hand over a section of the table, it would read out holographically uh, your DNA. Uh, and you would see it, if you put it closer, it would get molecular, you know, it would get more molecular, more atomic, it might have even gone to the quantum level. I don't know. They didn't discuss that. But uh, other tables, you put your hand over and you would see a readout of an animal form and the star system that it came from. And if you put your hand simultaneously over another section of the table, it would show you another animal with another star system plus a hybridization of the two animals. 
So this was a virtual Noah's Ark, but it was much more modern. Uh, another part of which they called the projection hall, you could go in and you could see uh, a 3D representation of the history of time, but it would be tailored to your own, uh, your own biology. So in other words, you might see a different history that might have to do with your genetics and your own personal interests versus what I might see. They might be, there might be some similar events, but you're gonna, and he saw basically, uh, the author was allowed to go in there for 45 minutes or so and look at this history. And he relays what he saw in, in his history uh, or according to his, uh, tailored to his biological mindset. So this is, uh, what they found. And of course, in that projection hall, there were three tunnels that led into the inner earth. And two led to similar locations, one in Egypt, another one led to one in Tibet via a similar one in Baghdad or beneath Baghdad. There was also one that went to Mongolia, according to the books. Another tunnel went straight into the, what they called the inner earth. Uh, but to get back to your question, why was Radu, why was there credibility in Radu's statement? Well, first, it was an interesting story. Uh, but in the second book, Transylvanian Moonrise is what it's called in English. Uh, there are several reports or copies of papers in the Romanian press translated into English that basically there was a lot of mail sent into the publisher to corroborate this by former Romanian intelligence people or people who knew, and they said, we know this aspect of the project, we know that aspect of the project. They didn't know everything. They didn't know the guts of what he's saying, but they knew enough about the secrecy. Now, when I actually went to the Sphinx and you take a cable car to get up there, it's also possible to walk, but you can take this huge cable car from the town of Bushteni, which is a mountain village, very beautiful. And the people there told me that in that time period, an inordinate amount of Americans were staying there and they were told not to talk about it. So that corroborates the story from a personal uh, reference point. It of course doesn't prove it, but I've talked to enough people. I've talked to people in the government who said that this is a legitimate character who works in the government. Um, there are other people, mostly from the Freemasons who say, this is all disinformation. It's all done by a committee. I know personally it's not done by a committee because I've been in correspondence with the author and there's a consistency in the writing and a consistency in the one person. Uh, there is, uh, he does have to, there are certain things he can't say. So he's subject to either a senior approval or a committee approval, but it's not put out by a committee. And, uh, but yet again, I've even met people who have met him, but he, I've never met him myself. But so in other words, uh, I've been involved in this for like, boy, over a decade. So it's like, and there's still what you say, life to the relationships. The um, David Anderson has been in my life like just over 20 years now, about 23 years. And he's been consistent in my life, even though he's not there very often compared to many people in my life who were very important to me who have fallen away. Uh, you know, people don't last in your life. So he's, he's lasted and he's had more staying power in my life than most people during my entire life. So th that, that's of course, David Anderson, Red Do, I've been working with uh, for since 2009, the book was published. So that's uh, about 13 years now. So this all began all because in 2003, uh, the US uh, had some planes overfly Romania, or maybe it was satellites, did this ground penetration, and they found some anomaly in the Bujaj Mountains. Right. And, and when they went in to investigate it, uh, they found this very large hemisphere area that uh, contained this um, well, I guess it's a, well, it's not an art, but a hall of record, if you like. So, you know, this area was described as a frequency shield. So can you describe that? I mean, when they were able to eventually get into the Bridge Edge Mountains, 
uh, that the Romanians and the US were able to arrive at a, a deal and were able to penetrate the mountain and go in and they found this uh, hemisphere shield. Oh, actually, you described in the book, or in the book describes two uh, frequency shields. Um, so how did, how did um, the, the, the chief protagonist in the story, which is uh, the, the character uh, Caesar Brad, how was he able to get through these frequency shields? Well, so much of the story centers around Caesar Brad, who is a uh, who was born uh, in during communist times in Romania in the 1970s with this huge umbilical cord. It was so strong that they could not cut the umbilical cord. The doctors couldn't cut it by normal means. They had to use a saw. Uh, and whenever they had an, a birth that was an anomaly, they were reported to the Securitate or the security force. And the Securitate came in and they brought uh, the head of the paranormal department. And the head of the paranormal department was uh, from China, from Red China. And he examined the baby and he would routinely monitor the baby as it grew up. And the what, what it turned out, they called him Dr. Zien. And Dr. Zien, was on loan to the Romanians to set up their paranormal department, which they called Department Zero. And in return, the Romanians who had a good education system would educate uh, X number of Chinese people. So the countries were good relations. So Dr. Zin is becomes the tutor of Caesar Brad as he gets older. Now, as he learns and is goes through, and this is discussed in the book, he eventually becomes uh, the point person or in charge of Department Zero. So eventually he's approached by this Italian Freemason uh, who wants him to open up the chamber, but he, he says, we'll, we will bring the technology from the United States. Of course, Caesar Brad is flabbergasted that this guy even knows who he is, let alone knows his name or what he's in charge of, because there's only like a couple people in the the country who even know of his role. So he realizes he doesn't want to help this man because this man is, is very evil, he feels, but he has no choice because if he doesn't cooperate, he will lose his position and he's not going to succeed anyway. So he, he decides to uh, try and play along with him and eventually outmaneuver him, which he does. But when it push comes to shove and, and these force fields appear and people are even killed by penetrating the force, force fields, uh, they finally find a, um, a relief on the side of the mountain as they opened it. It wasn't open in the first place as they opened it and it has a handprint on there. And it turns out that Caesar puts his hand on the, on the handprint and it fits him exactly. And that's what opens the force field. That's how they get in. So what you're dealing with here is a predestination and a fate. It's as if this was all a setup for him to be able to grow up and activate the machinations or processes by which they could penetrate the chamber. As it turns out, the Chinese doctor in the second book is not really what he seems to be. In the second book, he's seeking out not Caesar, but Radu Sinemar, the author, and, and wants to talk to him through an intermediary named Eleanor. And Eleanor uh, puts, gets a hold of the publisher, gets a hold of Radu, and they put him in touch with this Dr. Zen, but it turns out he's a Tibetan Lama. He's, he's really from Tibet and he escaped Tibet when the Dalai Lama was uh, escorted out of there and he went to China where he became ingratiated himself with the Chinese and he became head of their paranormal department. Uh, I don't know if they knew or recognized his role in Tibet or not, but he has friends in different places in the governments of the world. And so he was able to manipulate or orchestrate circumstances into Romania where this would lead to a series of events that are covered in the other books that uh, are designed to waken up mankind and are in alignment with ancient Tibetan texts and doctrines. 
one uh, piece of confirmation for this is that uh, in my own research, I wrote a book called uh, Rise of the Red Dragon, where I did research into this uh, Chinese scientist who set up the China's secret space program, um, you know, dating, he, he, he began working with the US uh, government in the, 19, in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, but uh, he eventually got interested in paranormal research and actually was uh, doing a lot of research into Chinese psychics in the 1970s and 1980s. So it absolutely uh, matches what you were saying, that uh, China was one of the world's leading authorities in paranormal research um, in the 1970s, which is around the time this mysterious Dr. Shen uh, began working with um, Caesar uh, Brad. So th there's a very bit of uh, in interesting bit of uh, confirmation. The doctor you're talking about was, I don't know how you pronounce his name, I think H-S-E-I-N or Hsien, that he worked with Jack Parsons at Jet That's Propulsion right. Laboratory. Yes. Yeah, I, I did not know, I don't know that much about him other than that he led the rocket program. I did not know he was so involved in paranormal work in China, which is which is a, a, a of great interest there. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, he he began with rocket research. He goes to China, um, helps them set up their space program, and then in the seventies and eighties, he starts getting involved in paranormal research. And you know, I, I document that in in my book, Rise of the Red Dragon. So yeah, that's a very interesting uh, development that people that get involved in uh, secret space programs or rocket uh, propelled uh, space programs eventually end up looking at. Uh, the paranormal as as a, a very uh, complementary field of research. Yeah, and that, that was I, I would I would I would comment there that um, the most and, and it was um, David Anderson who who pointed him out to me, but he's a, a standard staple of of physics. A man named Kurt Godel, uh, Kurt Godel, uh, Goodell is how people would say it in America. Goodell, Goodell, but uh, he uh, was the one who understood time the best, he understand what is called a closed time-like curve. And that is something scientists have wrestled with. Einstein said that he didn't retire because he liked walking home with Kurt Goodell. He just, he just the man was so brilliant. The, what's interesting to point out about Kurt Goodell, he was, he was obsessed with the occult and had to be institutionalized two times because of his uh, psychological problems, but he was a genius. So yes, it would seem to be that the uh, um, the rocket scientists are are involved in uh, occultism, paranormal. Yes, we well, we we know that um, uh, the 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 work of uh, Richard Hoagland and Mike Barra in uh, uh, Dark Mission, where they describe the involvement of uh, occultism with the NASA program, showing how high level Freemasonry is very much involved with the space program. And in the book, uh, Transylvania Sunrise, you describe this Signor Massini, or I, I guess that's a pseudonym, uh, for this high level Freemasonry. It's, not a, it's not a pseudonym, by the way. Oh, interesting. Not, it's not a pseudonym. I, th I thought it was too, but Radu said, no, it's not. That's oh, so we can trace this guy. Okay, well, so here's a, a, a real life personality. I assume he's probably uh, connected to the uh, black nobility in Italy, northern Italy. And so he's supposed to be this uh, very senior uh, Freemason who approaches uh, Caesar Brad and uh, gives him the ultimatum, as you described. So, and, and in the book, I mean, it, it, I mean, there's this kind of chilling analysis or overview of how Freemasons have implemented a kind of global control system. So I don't know if you want to summarize that for my audience. Well, he, you know, he he brags that he's a member of the uh, Bilderberger Group, and he's he's obviously very highly connected. He also speaks Romanian, which impresses Caesar Brad because Italians don't speak Romanian. It's hard for Italians to learn Romanian. Uh, it's not hard for Rom Romanians to learn Italian. Romania is the mother tongue of all the Latin languages and pretty much all the languages. This is There's been a lot of efforts to obfuscate Romania's or true history of, of how people came out of the Transylvanian basin. 
uh, as the ancestors of virtually all of Europe uh, because people had to retreat there during the Ice Age because it was protected. But that's, that's another story. But in any case, uh, he speaks Romanian fluently and he's obviously, he knows more than he should. And the, what, what fascinated me when I read the story was that David Anderson uh, learned his technology uh, by when he was in the Air Force creating space-time models for satellites. And he was helping them stabilize their position in space. As he, when he left the Air Force, because they weren't interested in his technology, he went out independently. And he then began to serve as a security company for satellite technology. And I couldn't help but think that his technology was being used by these satellites that had the ground penetrating radar that discovered this chamber. And, and I really don't know what David did or didn't know about it, but uh, certainly the people at the Pentagon shared this information with their compatriots in Italian Freemasonry, those who were in Freemasonry. And this is how, according to the story of how they were able to penetrate the um, the chamber with American technology. Another corroborative aspect of this story is that after this transpired in 2003, is when it happened during the August biorhythm that occurs every year and it was tied to the Philadelphia project and the Montauk project, 2003 August is when they opened it. And when they did, it was the collaboration of Romanians and Americans. And then after that, Romania became a part of NATO which it never was before. So this was a testament to the fact that there was a huge uh, cooperation between the two countries. And that, that serves as, as a corroboration, uh, not exactly a proof, but a corroboration. So some people even said Radu tried to take advantage of this collaboration to concoct this story. Uh, it's not exactly what happened. It's too good of a story to create. But anyway, so th this character was, uh, he eventually gets uh, eked out. He gets, he, he wanted to control the chamber, this Italian guy, Signor Massini. But uh, the problem was when it was all being done in secrecy, uh, Caesar Brad and his senior uh, General Obadia were doing this in secret. The president of Romania did not even know about it. The, Americans at the Pentagon were also doing it in secret, independent of the knowledge of the president, which was then George Bush. What happened is when they actually penetrated the chamber, it sent off a single, a signal in a corresponding chamber beneath Iraq, which was then had been broached, breached and discovered by American troops who had invaded Iraq. So when they saw this holographic presentation igniting this signal with a, a map showing that something had happened in Romania, they started to, you know, they called up command channels. So it wasn't hard to figure out. Uh, it got up to the president that there were American troops in Romania and they were, they were doing what they were doing. And he called the president in Romania and said, what are American troops doing in Romania? And he said, I don't know. And he called his general and said, what, what are these American troops doing here? So there was a lot of government chaos that happened as a result of this. And Caesar and his, his uh, boss had to go and explain to the Romanian president what was going on. The same thing had to happen with the Americans. What resulted in a lot of terse negotiations that were very highly charged. However, in the end, everybody got on the same page and that's when Romania became a part of NATO because Romania had to be protected. It had to be protected because of this technology. And the Romanians don't like the Russians anyway because they, they still have their national treasures that they stole in World War I. So there's, there is a less than a friendly uh, relation between the two countries. I mean, they are diplomatic. They do, it, it's not like there's, ultimate hatred, but, but there is personal re resentment, 
with the Romanians. So the Americans are now the protectors and they're uh, with all the stuff going on right now in the Ukraine, which is right north of Romania, is not going to impinge on Romania because they will have the full force of the United States military to back them up. And there are bases over there in Bulgaria and in Romania to, to protect those countries. You said something uh, quite interesting and something worth maybe uh, fleshing out a little bit is you, you talked about this uh, connection with the Montauk like the 20 years early in 1983 when the Montauk project came to an end. And I know uh, in the Montauk project uh, books, you know, there's this 20 year cycle starting from the Philadelphia experiment in 1943, then 1963, 20 years later, you have uh, 1983. Now, 20 years later after that, uh, you have uh, 2003, which is when the Bujedji, Bujedji, uh, discovery happens. So, you know, well, what is this 20 year loop? Why does it figure so prominently in the Montauk project? And, you know, is there a connection with this uh, Bucej discovery? Or you actually said well, Yes, yes, there is. It's, and it's called a biorhythm. And Preston Nichols was the one who taught me about it. It, it coincided with, you know, uh, the uh, biorhythms of the earth, which are studied by, uh, what do they call these people, dowsers and whatnot. And it also goes back to ancient Egypt, where this is known as the period of the Lion's Gate. It appears every August, every August approximately from 10 August to 14 August. And it's very interesting that all these dates have been very significant there. When I've gone to Romania, and I don't go to Romania to be there during that time period, it happens to be by my travel dates are set by reason of when the camp is. And the camp had to be backed up uh, in deeper into August because of the river flooding. So I've consequently, I've gone there many times uh, where I've stumbled upon things during this time period. Now, every year it happens, but every 10 years, it's very strong, but the strongest is every 20 years. So we have August 12th, August, uh, you know, 1943 is the Philadelphia experiment. 1963 was called the ITT Brentwood project. This was the beginning of the Heart project. It was at an antenna farm in Brentwood, New York, which is on Long Island, a couple hours from Montauk or so to the West. And then in 83, there was the Montauk project itself. Now, August 12th is declared to be the birthday of Isis in Egyptian mythology or Egyptian religion because it is the time when the star Sirius is most direct to the earth. And this is why they call it the lion's gate. It's a time of fertility. The lion symbolizes lust or fertility in that respect. And the, the, the flood would come into the Nile and the crops would be fertilized. It's a time of high heat, we know from the summer. Now, what's most interesting about all of this to me and my current work is that in uh, 2000, 14. In 2014, I visited Romania. And during this time period, I was taken to a cave by an archaeologist who wanted to show me the cave. He took me and my friends. I had at least three, uh, two Americans with me and about three Romanian friends. And we went to this cave. And okay, it's cave. Thank you for showing us the cave. Chaklavina Cave is the name of it. The following uh, year, David Anderson had called me and uh, to congratulate me on, on my marriage to a Romanian uh, lady. And we got to talking and then I asked him to do a podcast and he said, yes, he would. And then when we did the podcast, actually we had to do a pre-talk before the podcast because his uh, earphones or his microphone, I don't know what it was, his, his audio equipment had broken. So we had a discussion, it was very long. I said, what can you tell me about Romania when we do the podcast? He says, I'll have to get back to you. So he comes back and he says, there is a cave in Romania that's very special with regards to time anomaly. It's called Shaklavina Cave. He says, there has been this huge discharge of space-time motive force there, which can only occur in the presence of a time reactor. It's such high heat. So in other words, for it to have manifested, because when he does charge the time reactor, it results in this high heat and this element appears. It's hard to pronounce 
and I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation, but it's hydroxystalactite. And it's so anyway, well, I said, David, you know, it's very interesting. I was at that cave last summer. Oh, you were? Wow, that's interesting. What are the odds of me going to that cave? This is a cave, and that he has since said the most in exciting information has not yet been published. So I've made it my business to go back to that cave. I've got to that, I went back to that cave three times, uh, three more times. And on the third time, I was actually allowed to enter the cave. I was given, I didn't even ask. I was given equipment uh, and accompanied by people who knew what they were doing. And we went a mile deep into that cave because there's such high water. You have to have a boots and a wetsuit and, and um, a light with a helmet. And you need that helmet. And it was quite, it was the adventure of a lifetime. Now, uh, in 2023, which is a year from now, I'm going to be returning to that cave. I intend to return to that cave this summer uh, because I've uh, raised funds to put up a ham radio station nearby the antenna. I've made friends in the community up there. And this cave, uh, I think I got very close to where this time reactor did happen. What I do know is he says by reason of the sediment, they know that this reaction occurred 200 or 2000 years ago. 2000 years ago is the first century. And this is the time when an inordinate amount of people disappeared from that area in Romania. They don't know how to explain it. A, a large amount of people disappeared. It's also the time of the invasion of the Romans, Emperor Trajan, who invaded um, Dacia as it is known or was known, uh, which is the heart of Transylvania. And he invaded that. But a lot of the Dacians didn't die. They just disappeared. And a, an ostensible explanation is that something happened in time and they escaped by going into this cave. They were known to hide in the caves anyway, because there's extensive caves in Transylvania. So this is what my, my current uh, research, and of course, uh, David knows what I'm doing. He doesn't say much about it other than that he's enthusiastic about what I'm doing as far as putting up the ham radio uh, station, which I will have, I will not do it myself, but I have friends in Romania who will do it. I just need to give them the money, which has already been raised. So this is very interesting. I mean, you mentioned the 20 year biorhythm of the earth. Yeah. Uh, 2003, Bujeji is discovered, an incredible discovery. Um, and we'll talk more about what was discovered in the Hall of Records. Uh, but then, I mean, 2023 that you just mentioned, and you're, you're going back, setting uh, to this cave, but, you know, just 2023 here, does that, uh, in terms of these biorhythms, is that going to be a really major year in terms of these discoveries, these time anomalies? I think so. I public? think so. And let me, let me put it this way. It's like... I'm quote unquote, I'm, I'm saying this metaphorically, betting all of my assets on this. Now I'm not really betting anything because if 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 I come up with a with a dud, it doesn't mean anything other than it came up as a dud. But I'm not losing any money. But all of my work has indicated that this is a very special time because in 2003. Uh, all of those of us who paid attention to this phenomenon were awaiting what's going to happen in 2003. Well, something did happen in 2003 during that time period. It occurred on August 14th. Al Bielik had predicted a major blackout. He predicted this on a uh, coast to coast show, radio show. So he predicted that on, uh, between August 10th and 14th, there would be a major blackout. Well, there was a major blackout. I remember it. I was in Home Depot at the time and the saw stopped working. It was cutting this big piece of wood. And, and I said, wow, did we cause that? No, we didn't cause it, but we thought we did. And then the blackout, uh, as it turned out, was the center point of the black ground, back of the blackout was Preston Nichols property in Cairo, New York. It extended all the way into Ohio, up into Canada, all the way to Montauk. And it was, and, and, and of course it was, prevalent in New York City and, and in Long Island where I lived. So it was this huge radial center that was the center of Preston's property. So we thought we had the blackout figured out in August of 2023. It wasn't until four years later that I actually read the book. It was sent to me much earlier, but I didn't read it until 2007 or eight. And 
I, I read the book and I said, wow, this occurred during that same time period. That was a surprise to me. What happened was much bigger. So if I go to Transylvania next year and nothing happens or I don't see anything happen, uh, I might find out something big did happen. I just wasn't aware of it. I didn't know, I will, I will not find out until later. However, by reason of some of the phenomena around this cave, I found, find out that on holy days, there will be this emanation that will appear from the cave in front of the cave, like a, like a bolt of light or golden light that goes into the sky. The holy days are Christmas, New Year's, or Easter. And I, it's possible I might see something in August, but I don't know. Uh, but also because I'm getting more in communication with the people, I've talked to the people who've seen this sort of thing. And as they get closer to the light, it disappears. But even before I met them or knew about it, the night before I had a dream, a similar dream about me uh, orchestrating a, a bolt of light. Uh, so it was like, it, the, it, this stuff works through my dreams as well. Dreams are the connectivity between the conscious world and the unconscious world. So what I find is I engage myself with Chaklavina Cave, I'm talking to nature itself. I'm talking to nature. I'm communing with nature in my own particular way. Uh, so th this is very interesting because it's, it's getting into communication with the earth. And on the first day I met Preston Nichols, uh, he was giving a lecture. He says, you can talk to me, but I'm giving a lecture. You have to talk to me at the break. It's a lecture on earth changes. And there was a, a panel of people who were talking about the upcoming earth changes. Of course, we've had some experience with that since 1990, about 30 years worth of experience. So I want to just go back to uh, the discovery inside Gujaj um, Mountain, this uh, hall of record or uh, projection uh, room that is described in Transylvania Sunrise and, and there's a, a diagram in there and I just wanted to kind of like go into more detail into what is inside this hall of record which you know truly is fascinating especially if, if this is something that is eventually going to be revealed to the world and I know there's a, a lot of struggle apparently the, you know, as part of the rationale for the book series that this was kind of like a compromise between the American and Romanian governments in terms of disclosing this, that uh, there's a kind of official, you know, wink that uh, the, the books by Rado Cinema are, are kind of a way to get this information out. So you have this diagram and it describes uh, this projection room and on the periphery uh, around the side of the room, you have these holographic tables that uh, uh, have, uh, that project things for, for viewers. And then in the center, you, you have uh, some kind of semi-cylinder device uh, that uh, amplifies thought energy. Um, and then there's um, um, some kind of uh, amphora dis that's describing, uh, you describe an amphora that contains monatomic gold. So can you kind of like give us a little more information about what's in this hall of records and the different elements in it? Well. It, it's it's hard for me to remember. To, you gave a, a very good description there. I don't know that I could improve much on it because it's been so long since I've first read and edited the book. I've read it several times, but what you have is a. Uh, it's like if I could equate it to um, a Disneyland of consciousness in there, you know, where, where Disneyland gives all this sort of attractive stuff to lighten up your mind in terms of entertainment. This is not only entertaining, it's all about raising the vibration of your consciousness. And it does include a, a, a vessel or a vase with, with, with monatomic white gold that is like no other. It's a special isotope of white gold. Um, so it, it accelerates the consciousness. This becomes a theme later on in one of the books but it's all about changing your vibrational frequency. And even when we get into the final book, Radu has now taken a crystal from a similar installation in Baghdad, and he's trying to build his own device, his own chair uh, with the help of Caesar. And it's costing a tremendous amount of money. In other words, this is to jump. This is after he's had visitations through other tunnels, through other technology, 
uh, visited people from the inner earth, which is all very spectacular. But now, even despite having all of that, this is sort of like, and I don't mean to be insulting here, but it's sort of like going to amusement parks. You've gone to Disneyland and, and all of its different derivatives in Shanghai or Tokyo, wherever they are, Paris. And then you go home and you want to have your own little mini Disneyland in your house, you know, so that you can, of course, I'm trivializing it here by comparing it to Disneyland, but Disneyland is, is a place which excites the mind of not only kids, but adults. It excites the mind in an entertaining way, perhaps a manipulative way to those who are cynical about Disneyland with good reason. But anyway, so you want to have your own little private Disneyland in your basement so you can put on goggles and go on all the rides. Well, he's not going on rides. He's exploring uh, consciousness. And it's all about connecting the inside world with the outside world, which is the opposite of autism. Autism is when you, you, you became completely self-absorbed and you can't communicate with the outside world. The op opposite is is what would be balanced where you're, you're communicating with the outside world. In his case, it's the inner earth. It's the inner earth and, and then whatever is outside of the, the planet as well, the consciousness outside there. So it's, it's trying to jumpstart that consciousness, which is of course, uh, in some respects, the challenge of mankind uh, going way back when, getting off the wheel of samsara as the Buddhists or Hindus would refer to the, the veil of illusion. And one of these concepts is the, the Ouroboros or the snake eating its tail, which equates exactly to the David Anderson uh, concept of which he introduced me. It's not his concept. It's a scientific concept of the Ouroboros, which is the closed time-like curve. It's like time, the beginning is the end. So you, it, it, no matter how you uh, experience this from an objective standpoint, it brings us back to the, the spiritual dilemma of the riddle of the Sphinx. The riddle of the Sphinx is, you know, what, what, what is mankind? What is mankind? So this is the quintessential riddle of mankind and it's connecting not only spirit with matter, but the experience and the consciousness. So it's, uh, I suppose the mystery only ends when it ends. And these books have brought out this, this um, challenge or this idea uh, very in a very entertaining way in a very enlightening way so yeah the books are uh, well that book i've read is uh, truly is fascinating with uh, its description of what happens in the hall of record uh, I, I was very impressed with the way in which uh, radu cinema and uh, caesar brad describe how the past history of humanity just becomes crystal clear uh, with these holographic projections that appear in the Hall of Records. And now as a researcher, and, and uh, you're, you're the same, I mean, you know, that's a dream to be able to kind of like get in front of one of these holographic projections and look at these historical events going back thousands of years and to kind of like really get a clear uh, depiction in, in what, what happened. And I know, um, um, kind of like book five, I just got book five in the series, I'm just beginning to read it, but it talks about uh, the genesis of humanity, and I, I guess a lot of that genesis and the history of how the different uh, uh, DNAs... That's book six, different... excuse me, Michael, that's book six. I say book six. Got the genesis. Book five is Inside the Earth. I see. That's well, about the adventures into civilizations beneath the earth, which is tell, told very coherently. Uh, the Forgotten Genesis book is all about the, the formation of DNA uh, orchestrated by extraterrestrial energies or forces or, or beings. And it goes deeply into that. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of complicated. The book is complicated. Simple well, and complicated well, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's one of the things that uh, I did want to kind of like um, ask you a little bit about. I mean, the creators of the Hall of Records. I mean, it's this, I mean, you describe the, um, the platforms as being very high um, and that these were very tall extraterrestrials or beings that created this Hall of Records. So 
exactly what, what is known about the creators of this Hall of Record in the Bujej Mountains? Oh, it's very interesting that you ask that because in the third book, Mystery of Egypt, uh, they go to recover, they're actually recovering what amount to CDs and they're not CDs, but they're, they're, they're stones. And it's like a CD concept because they store all this information and there's a light will read out and holographically tell you the history. And they're all stored in these, I, I don't know what to call them, like steles or pieces of stone that are like stone, but they're, it's, it's just a modern version of a CD that ha has a holographic uh, printout. That's what they're going there for. Now, on that adventure, uh, they find another chair. It's different than the Hall of Records, but they can actually travel in time. But when they travel in time, they cannot, it's, they're not traveling, only their mind is traveling. So if they're going back to the time of Napoleon, they will see Napoleon, but they can't go up and shake his hand or flick his ear or, or do anything. They just watch it. Now, what happens is that see, Radu gets to experience it to some degree himself, but Caesar is experienced in it. He's been there before. And when he goes in and tries to find out about who's building it and who they are, he's blocked. He's not allowed to scrutinize the builders, which is very interesting because this is a guy whose security clearance is, is what anybody would dream to have if you're interested in finding out secrets. He's like, he's way up the chain, the food chain on, on secrets. And then he gets to a point where he's not allowed to know himself, which I, I thought was really interesting. You know, he, he, there is a point beyond which he, you know, thou shalt not ask because you can't ask. Um, Radu was very secretive to me when he first, after the first book, he sent me a CD and he says, you know, we can't ask or talk about who built it. And then he kind of pretty much tells you who built it from his perspective, which is, you know, this alien uh, consciousness, so to speak. But it's, it's really, whatever it is, whether it's a extraterrestrial in the sense of, or whether it's ultra dimensional, whatever it is, it's outside of ourselves, it's also inside of ourselves. Because the fifth book, Inside the Earth, goes into the center of the Earth, having a consciousness in itself, but it's all being manifested out of a black hole. So it goes into the science of the black hole, and it's very interesting. But that concept is, it's like, you know, intelligence is intelligence. We are only, as human beings, we become egocentric and self-centered, self-referential to intelligence, which intelligence is self-referential, but we tend to think it all comes from humans. When humans are just a manifestation of intelligence and a manifestation which has happened to at least control the, the visible surface world. Uh, so it's all about intelligence. The, all these books are about intelligence manifesting itself and doing it in such a way as it becomes an enlightening experience, uh, at least for, for myself and those of, who've enjoyed the books. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the uh, interesting connections uh, about uh, the, the book Transylvania Sunrise and uh, the creator of that, uh, or the creators of the Hall of Records, the connection to this alien intelligence is that at the moment, I'm kind of doing, been doing a, quite a bit of research on the Council of Nine material that was uh, initially set up by Dr. Andrea Puharic in the 19, in the 1970s when he had Yuri Geller and then he had Phyllis Schlemmer do channeling of the Council of Nine. And uh, the Council of Nine talked about 24 extraterrestrial civilizations that made up uh, kind of like these cedars and that they were responsible for the creation of human life on Earth, that these different extraterrestrial civilizations would create create one civilization. They described the Altians as creating Atlantis. They described the Hoovers as creating uh, the Hebrew nation. And so uh, this sounds to be very similar. There's a seems to be a connection here with the with this kind of the the, the whole record. So you know, do you want to elaborate on that or comment? Well, I, I can only say that. Um... I have a big issue with Andre Puharic 
uh, and anything that comes out of his domain. Because when I first did the Montauk Project, he was the first character to appear on my radar screen, I say that metaphorically, as antithetical to the work that was being brought out by myself, completely antithetical. And then I looked into his history. He was a, you know, he was definitely a mind control psychiatrist from the army. There was no, there was no even argument about it. I mean, this is who he was, this is who we said he was. So he's operating right out of the psychological department of the army. And I just, you know, I'm not an expert on the Council of Nine. I've known of the Council of Nine. Uh, I, I've not really gotten into it. I don't, uh, I'm not personally really prejudiced towards ET uh, correlations with human DNA, even in the book that I so uh, put much, put so much blood, sweat and tears into that book, Forgotten Genesis. It's like, this is Radu's story. It's not my story. I, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's just, you know, all of these theories with all of this DNA, it gets weird. It gets, it's too much for me to process as a, as a reasonably intelligent person. It's so, I don't get too excited about it. I, I, I focus much more, uh, I, I practice Qigong, I focus much more on my actual life than I do in trying to figure out this DNA stuff. This is just my viewpoint because people get very excited about it though. They read that book and they like it. They, they love it because it explains things to them. So I can't be a, a judge on it. It's not my job to judge. It's just, I'm saying it, it sort of gets, goes beyond my, uh, what, what, I, what I would have done if I was in that chair. I would have asked about the, the 24th chromosome, the 24th gene pair, I should say. It's referred to as the 24th chromosome. And that's a theory that is backed up biologically, whereby mankind once had 24 gene pairs, and then it, two jammed into one, and all of a sudden, mankind wasn't so smart anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is what this is the history I would have asked about if I was in the chair. But as they say, anybody who sits in that chair has their own orientation. And this mm -hmm. is what Radu learned. And it was really hard for him, he told me, to, to put all that stuff into book form. He took a lot of notes. He really worked his butt off in that regard. Mm -hmm. Well, just to kind of like, um, you know, back up to the Council of Nine material, um, I mean, Andrea Puharic kind of like set it up, but, uh, you know, what we know the most about the Council of Nine actually comes, comes from uh, the material Phyllis Schlemmer channeled and released from 1973 up until 1994, um, and, and that was kind of like Andrea Puharic kind of like the part of the scene, but she carried on with that material. And it, and it talked about the, these 24 extraterrestrial civilizations that had seeded humanity. And what I found interesting uh, was that uh, later on, I find, I find these uh, different uh, contactees or insiders talking about 22 genetic experiments that extraterrestrials had set up that go back hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and so there seems to be some correlation between multiple extraterrestrial civilizations setting up uh, up to 22 different uh, genetic experiments over many hundreds of thousands of years involving different human ethnic and racial groups. And you know, this is somehow connected to these 24 extraterrestrial cedars or, or uh, civilization. So um, yeah, there, there's a very interesting connection there. And of course, you know, this is tied in would, with the Hall of Records. But what I would say, what what is more uh, perhaps, well, more influential, perhaps, per, per what Radu was saying, is he talks a lot about how much the stars, the subtle energies of the stars and the positioning of the stars influence the, the development of DNA. He definitely talks about beings steering, you know, the DNA, but so much of it's developing on its own, but under the influence of the magnetism of stars the gravity of the moon, he says the gravity of the moon has a whole pull on the DNA that, that creates energy that would not be there if there was no moon. He says the moon was put there, uh, more or less put there. Uh, so, so all of the subtle energies of the stars, and he says it may take, you may think 
there's no influence from a star. Well, over tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, there is an influence of a star. He's not necessarily saying gravitational. He's probably talking more in terms of subtle energy. So in terms of what he's saying, yes, there is influence by ETs, for lack of a better word, but there's also the generational, like the experience. Okay, so you have a life. You were put in a body, and then you grow up, and you go to school, you meet people, you work, you do all these activities. This is your own growth process, and the growth process is very important. It's sort of set up, but you've been given an environment to live in. You know, you've been given parents uh, or a food source of some sort and educational sources. So it's all about the development. And of course, I'm talking about on an individual basis, but also on a collective basis. So the whole, what's the whole tribe going to grow into? Are they going to grow into, you know, good guys, bad guys, or or inventors or whatever? And this is sort of, it's it's sort of like evolution jump-started or taken to a critical point is what he does talk about but there is definitely an influence it's just sort of like you know what steers the what steers the primordial masses or blobs to, to form into life form sort of thing there is some steering but there's also it it, it goes on its own that that was my only comment mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I've found fascinating about uh, uh, Transylvania, Transylvanian sunrise is uh, how the discovery at the Bujej Mountains were tied into geopolitical events. I mean, 2003, uh, you have uh, Romania basically joining NATO because of the discovery, because of the US fast track NATO's, uh, the US fast track uh, Romania's entry into NATO, you know, to give it protection, to kind of get a stranglehold on, on what was discovered there. Uh, you, you have the events in Iraq where you have the invasion of Iraq. So, you know, this kind of like says that, well, underneath these kind of major geopolitical events that uh, people get absorbed about, you know, there are often these kind of like, whether you call it esoteric, whether you call it exopolitical factors that are driving all of that. So, you know, maybe this is uh, speculation, but for you, but uh, do, do you think at this point in time, uh, with this Russian intervention in Ukraine, do you think it might be tied in to these esoteric or exopolitical events? People have liked to say that there are pyramids in the Ukraine, which I believe there are. It's just not something I've gotten deeply into. There's always an esoteric war going on. Uh, and, and the esoteric war is always a hidden hand. Uh, it doesn't mean that the world leaders are as much privy to it as, as historians might later claim they were. But yes, the, the, there's there's always an esoteric war going on and, and it goes down into the, the core of, of good and evil as well. It, and it gets very complicated. It gets very complicated. So, uh, but the, the problem is with, with the current situation with Russia and the Ukraine, you have, you have too many armchair quarterbacks where and, and, and it's seen there is the apparency that the the military decisions are being played out in the press. And that would seem absurd. You know, should we send MiGs? Should we not send MiGs? This is ridiculous. This is not how you fight a war. This is like you're you're announcing to your opponent what you're going to do or what you might going to do. And the, but it seems that to a great deal of the the war is being fought in the press instead of, you know, <laughs> you just don't shout out your window that you're coming after these people in the neighborhood. It's, it's ridiculous. So uh, yeah, there's always an esoteric war, but I, I don't necessarily know that it's what we're in a position to think it is. Mm -hmm. um, I did do an astrological chart on Putin and, and said that he comes from a very dark place. This is his planetary natal horoscope. He comes from a very dark place and, and he, he does have a shelf life on him. Uh, which I, I, I think will be in a few months. A Vedic astrologer using a different system said it, it would be November 22. Uh, I, I think it'll be a, a, around the solstice uh, that he will uh, have some big problems. That's just my uh, hip shoot astrology uh, mm -hmm. interpretation. Well, you know, some of the sources that I've been working with have identified uh, 
these ancient arcs that are being discovered around the world. And they identified uh, one of these arcs in southern Ukraine near the city of Kherson. Uh, okay. That this is this, in fact, is what is uh, really driving the conflict there. So uh, I don't know if that's anything um, you want to speculate about, if you know anything about it. But it does seem that there's a kind of connection between this ancient arc that has been allegedly found in southern Ukraine with these halls of records that are that are being uh, that you found or through the Radu Cinema series of books are being found around the world. Well, this this is the thing, when when you find a piece of arc or a piece even a pyramid or a you know it could have great value to archaeologists and even great monetary value, but it's it's sort of like what is somebody going to do with it? You know, it's kind of like the spear of destiny. It's more symbolic than, than you know, than the places that this is talking about is accessing a vibrational frequency, which is as the, you deeper into it, you're getting outside of this reference frame of this earth. So it's like, this is not an area you can penetrate. This goes back to the Christian paradigm of 2000 years ago when people would write the, the Vesica Pisces, the, the two interlocking spheres, the fish was a symbol of another world. They're escaping to the other world. They're not, it's not about this world. It's like this world, at least from a biblical reference point, is the devil's world. What do you want this world? So if the if the Russians or whoever are going after some ark where they expect they're going to find some secret, it's more like they're going through a portal. They're looking for the, the portal, but they're not going to be able to do anything with the portal because they're all stuck in materiality. Un unless you can make them some evil demonic force that's, you know, what, what, what would they need with that? I, I don't understand. I'm not saying it's not the case. I just don't understand the pragmatism of, of what they would be doing. And I, I don't know enough about the, you know, the, the arcs you're talking about, but the, the real key is is not in this world it's the transition to the other world and then maybe to go back and forth i mean do they have a portal there what do they have uh it, it's it's i guess it makes for good mystery but i i, I think you know I, 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 I it's just my personal opinion that that putin is quite crazy as well mm -hmm. that's just my personal opinion so i i don't know all of the motivations but uh, and I, I'm just too uninformed about the the esoteric Ukraine or Uter Ukraine's esoteric to to make a you know a, a cogent comment on it other than what I've said. Well, I've only read the first book of this uh, of the, the six uh, books that have been translated into English of seven, the Transylvanian seven, book seven, series. Seven. 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 Wow. So I, I do plan to read more, and um, I mean I would love to have you back so we can discuss more books in the series. Uh, so, you know, where can listeners go to find out more, uh, you know, where they can uh, purchase uh, the Transylvania sure. book series and any information about your earlier Montauk books? Well, yes, they can find all of my books on uh, skybooksusa.com, skybooksusa.com. They can go to Kindle or Amazon. Uh, most of the books are on iTunes. And I will say one thing is Inside the Earth, which is the fifth book, which is all, and to me, that's probably the most interesting one because he's visiting, it's the most coherent book ever written on the ins, inner earth that I've ever read. And of course I've read it several times and I, I helped translate it. But that book is now virtually out of print. Uh, I've got a few copies left, not many. And it's, it's out of print, it's being reprinted, but this is the problem in the printing. I can get it on Kindle. There's no problem getting it on Kindle in ebook form, but it's, I'm getting it reprinted right now. They told me it would take three to four months to reprint it. This is outrageous because there is a big paper shortage. So right now that book was hell to translate for a number of reasons, numerous reasons. And I felt that the difficulty in printing that book was commensurate to the value it has. And now I'm going to reprint it and I'm told I have to wait three to four months. I told them right away, I said, reprint it. At twice the price, of course, the prices have gone up. So it's like, okay, 
raise the price of the book, which I have. But so I would recommend people get that book on Kindle, Inside the Earth. And that's a great book. The, the next book you would read in the series would be Transylvanian Moonrise. And I will also tell you that the first chapter of that book, the actual chapter one, uh, The Man the Time Forgot, is the best chapter I've ever read of any book for me. And I'm, I'm not the author, I'm the, the editor. But I was just stunned when I read it because it's about an alchemical tradition. Uh, it may not have the same effect on you, but it might. And, um, it, 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 and, and of course, that's preceded by a, a prelude or an introduction which features the articles that corroborate the first story. So anyway, that, I just wanted to share that with you. I would recommend you read Transylvania Moonrise next if, you, if you're interested in that. So it, it's really been a pleasure to be with you and uh, thank you for bringing up the things you did. Well, well, thank you, Peter. It's been great to talk to you. Um, I'm certainly a fan of this book series and I look forward to doing more interviews with you in the future if you're available. Oh, certainly I'll make myself available. Great, well, one, one, wonderful. Well, thank you. That was uh, Peter Moon. Uh, editor of the Transylvania Book Series. Thank you so much. You have been listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.